Jesus being the, the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. Obviously, there was some foreknowledge. There's no question about that. But one thing that we need to understand, I think sometimes people conflate two subjects. Okay, so foreknowledge means that you know something ahead of time. You can know something ahead of time and not be the cause of that thing. All right, I've heard an illustration. Like if you're, if you're up on a high vantage point and you look down below and you see two vehicles on a road headed towards each other, you know ahead of time what's going to happen. There's going to be a wreck. Or if there is a wreck, you could say, well, I knew that was going to happen. That doesn't mean you're the cause of it. And sometimes I think people conflate the idea of God's foreknowledge with causation. Well, just again, just because God knows something ahead does not mean that he is the cause of it. So we need to have that clear in our minds. Uh, Jesus knew. John, the Gospel of John tells us, I think it's in chapter 13, when he was washing the disciples' feet. He knew from the beginning who would betray him. But did Judas not have a choice in the matter? I mean, John chapter 12 tells us his character flaw. What was it? He liked money. He was a thief. And not only was he a thief, but what was his position, if you will, among the apostles? He was the treasurer. Well, that's probably not the best setup. You've got a thief in charge of the purse. Well, anyway, no, something being foreknown does not mean that it is caused by the person who foreknows it. And God, a lot of blame is laid at God's feet that does not belong there. Saying that God permits evil, allows evil, again, is not the same thing as saying that God causes evil either. We need to understand that too. So, Sure. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. He could choose. So, everything that happens in this chapter, so we, again, we read the first five verses last week, looked at those. We haven't even gotten to the sin yet. We've just gotten to the conversation between the agent, which is the serpent, the agent that Satan used, and Eve, and we kind of finished talking where we were there in verse 5, that Eve viewed God's restriction as protective and not punitive. Satan twisted his words and made God seem... Uh, well, the way I phrased it, I think it was in last week's outline, like God was holding the monopoly on being God. And if, if you just do this, you'll be just like him, which is obviously a misrepresentation. But... Uh, Somebody go ahead and read for us verses 6 and 7, and let's see what happens here. All right, so your first blank there, verse 6 outlines Satan's approach, his approach. And when you look at all three descriptions here, or these three phrases of verse 6, and I've got it for you in your outline here. The tree was good for, for, good for food. Well, that's a lust of the flesh. A desire, the, word desi, the word lust, desire, desire is not always a bad thing. Coveting, for instance, in the New Testament most of the time, covetousness is bad, isn't it? But Paul told the Corinthians to covet earnestly the best spiritual gifts. So context will tell you. So these natural desires, okay, food, that's not sinful to have that desire to see this is good. Well, she saw that the tree was good for food. That is a lust of the flesh, an appetite, if you will. That it was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes, obviously. And it would make one wise. Well, that's the pride of life. And I've, talk, I've talked on that before from 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Those are the three avenues of temptation. Every temptation falls under one of those three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And she's hit directly by all three. Um, 
Well, let's look at this. The woman, second blank here, the woman was deceived. All right, she allowed the conversation to proceed beyond her initial, well, God said don't eat it, don't even touch it because we'll die. Okay, that might have been a good cutoff point, don't you think, for that conversation? That's the end of the story. I'm not, do, I'm not doing this, but she allowed that conversation to progress. You won't die, again, Verse the end of verse 3. And then he changes, he alters what God said in verse 4. So, the woman was deceived and the man allowed himself to be tempted by the woman. And I've, I've run into some people who disagree with me here, but look at the end of verse 6 again. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. To me, that implies he was there. She saw all this, she took it and gave to her husband with her. So a couple weeks ago, we were talking about being subservient, you know, being passive. Uh, you know, we, we use that phrase, beta, being a beta male here. He was subservient when he shouldn't have been. He abdicated his role. And, well, that's why the biblical text, like in 1 Timothy 2 and in 2 Corinthians 11, tells us that the woman was deceived in this event here. So she takes it, the fruit, and ate it. Pretty straightforward stuff there. Looks good. Tastes good. It's going to benefit you mentally. Well, they gave in to temptation. Any questions or comments on that first verse there? A couple of questions. Did this tree look any different from the other trees? I don't know. Just something to think about. Was the fruit more appealing than, than all of the other fruit? Well, there's nothing in the text that indicates that it was... I mean, it was good for food, but so was the rest of the fruit in the garden that they were permitted to eat. Was the real temptation in what Satan claimed there in verse 5, you will become like God? That seems to be the, where the switch is flipped. This is just a fruit tree. Now, it's been identified as one you don't eat of, but seems the main temptation was in the, the, what would fall under the category of the pride of life. And uh, that's when she gave in. It, well, it, the, that's the, he, the, the, he, the Hebrew term for God or gods. There are actually a few words. Let me, let me pull it up here. Uh, but the term itself is... If I'm thinking correctly, Elohim, which is a plural term, it's a plural noun, and there are other passages in the in the Old Testament that use that word. Yeah, that's that's the word. It, it's in various contexts. Sometimes it's translated like rulers or judges. You're going to obtain some kind of power. I don't know. Like some versions of the Bible have it capitalized. Um, uh, well, like the New King James has it capitalized in verse 5 there. The King James doesn't. So, that's just, that's one of those words that context will always tell you the meaning. You're going to be like, you're going to become very powerful people if you do this. I think sometimes we see, particularly capital G, God, we automatically think of God. And that's not always the meaning of that term. And I wonder if it may be in this particular conversation, you're gonna, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to have power that you didn't have before. Because that is one of the definitions of that term. You'll be powerful beings. I think that's a legitimate way to look at that, yes. Based on how that term is used throughout the rest of the Old Testament, yes. I don't think so. No, there's no, obviously there would be no, you know, idolatry going on or anything like that, but here's power, it's right here in front of you, and God said you can't have that? Well, he's just trying, and that's what I was saying last week, he's trying to monopolize the, the realm of God, being God, and well, you can be just as powerful as he if you do this.
Well, and I used the word last week, naive. Because, you know, as you said, at the end of creation, God looked at everything and behold, it was very good. Nothing changed about that until the sin occurred. Yes. And the, Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So maybe, maybe psychologically it was more appealing. Perhaps even when God said, don't eat of that tree. You know, what were they thinking when God said, you can have anything in here you want except that one? What? Oh, really? Why not? And then how much time elapsed between that restriction from Genesis 2.17 to the temptation that occurs in chapter 3, verse 1? We don't know. I'm going to assume it's a very short period of time. But we don't know regardless. Uh, it was certainly appealing to them. No question about that. But I wonder if it's more the, the temptation and what you can become like gods. You can become very powerful. Whatever that word might mean in that particular context. How was the serpent able to communicate? Well, how was, how was Balaam's donkey able to communicate? You know, there are times when that kind of stuff was permitted. Um, what, what were the conditions in the garden prior to the sin? One thing I said last week, it's like when this occurs, so far as we can tell from the text, she's not taken aback by it. The fact that she's talking to a serpent. She, she answers this question. And again, I, we, may, we can speculate all we want. We just don't know. Uh, but it's, it's the... So over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul... Verses 14 and 15. I'll tell you what, somebody turn over there and read that. Since I'm mentioning it. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. It seems to me, here's the way I view this, Miss Judy. The serpent was simply an agent. I don't think the serpent was Satan himself. It's an agent that was used to communicate to Adam and Eve. Uh, then, like you have in John chapter 8, where Jesus is talking about, talking to these hypocritical Jews, he says, you are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. Well, he lied to Adam and Eve through the serpent, through the medium of the serpent, you know. Uh, who's got 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15? Go ahead, John. Okay, stop right there. Satan himself was transformed into an angel of light. So the, the Greek word for angel is angelos. And there are times, I believe, where that it shouldn't be translated because what, do they do? What, is, what happens there? I've, told you, I've explained this before. When you've got this word in the Greek, angelos, and then you just have the word angel. They didn't define the term. They didn't translate it. They just pulled the, the Greek letters and put them in English letters. Angelos is angel, but the word means messenger. So read it that way. And do a messenger. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. So even in New Testament times, Satan has ministers, agents through whom he does his work, specifically in 2 Corinthians 11, false apostles. So how did all of that communication take place? Was it something Adam and Eve were used to? There's no indication that that's the case, that the animals were going about talking. They're animals. So it seems uh, 
the, the method used was agency. That Satan had some power. And, and that's another thing we do learn later on in Scripture, particularly in the book of Job, is that God does grant Satan leeway, if you will. Uh, Brother Cates used to describe it, particularly in the book of Job. He taught Job in our school. And uh, he said it's, you know, picture, the way to picture what Satan is and the power that he has, it's like a dog that's on a, a, a long rope tied between, between two trees. He's got room to move, and if you get in his territory, you're probably going to get bit. But he's limited, and he's not all-powerful and all-knowing and all of that. So you've got it in the Old Testament. You've got it repeatedly in the New Testament that he has his messengers, angels, that, that do his work. Mm-hmm. Yes. What I mean when I say naive is up to this point in time, they had no experience with evil. Yes. Yeah, that is a legitimate question, and it would be kind of speculative, but here's my speculation on that. I don't think there was anything magical in the fruit itself. It was in the restriction that God gave. And when that occurred, some switch came on. Because, well, as was read in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened. Well, they weren't walking around with their eyes closed, and they weren't wearing blindfolds. They weren't blind. So that has, that, that's not a physical description of what happened when they ate the fruit. I think the connection is with the restriction and not the not just the fact that they ate a piece of fruit. The choice, yes. They're, they're, it's their first, so far as we have recorded in script, well, it would have to be. It's their first exercise of free will to disobey God. Let's go to James chapter 1 real quick. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here because I want to move on through some other things here in Genesis, but this is a key passage in understanding the nature of temptation. And I've talked to people in the past that, that truly believe that being tempted is wrong. Well, if, if being tempted is wrong, then Jesus was in the wrong. So, somebody read James 1, 13 to 16. Okay, stop right there. Drawn away of what? His own lust. She saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was able to make one wise. Well, how did she know that it was able to make one wise? Where did she get that information? Because Satan said, through the serpent, right, said, you'll become like gods if you eat this. All right, go ahead. All right, the, the description there is of a, of a, essentially the process of reproduction or a copulative relationship between temptation and one's own desires and then giving in to that. And the, the result of giving in is the birth of sin. And of course, sin leads to death. But being tempted is not wrong. Um, now, perhaps putting yourself in a place putting yourself in situations where you know bad things are going to happen or temptations might come, that might be something to talk about. But uh, we need to understand the nature of temptation, the origin of sin and all of that within ourselves. Our own lusts. And, but not only that, but then you're enticed. That word in the, that word in the Greek is a, it's a, like a fishing term for us. It, you're baited along. You're lured in to something that, that really appeals to you. Well, Genesis 3, 6, this all very much appealed to her. And when they ate, then the eyes of both of them were opened. So the next blank on your outline here, the root of every sin. Does anybody know this blank? I've talked about it here before. 
Every sin, one word, describes the root of it. Any ideas? I just thought I'd see. Selfishness. What did you say? Selfishness. I don't care what sin it is. At the root, at the heart of it, is, again, James 1, drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. I want to fulfill something that's, that I feel is lacking in me. The root of every sin is selfishness. So then I have this. Notice the contrast between 2.25. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And 3.7. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Something happened here. And I think, again, it's, in, it's, it's the result of their deliberate disobedience to a specific command of God. So, next bullet point here. Adam and Eve were not blind. It's your next blank. Prior to their sin. It seems to me they became self-conscious. I mean, those of you who have, who have and have had little children, Sarah was ours, never wanted clothing on when she was little. Never. And there was no sense of, maybe I shouldn't be like this, or, you know, this is embarrassing. You know, the way we adults might think of it, if we're running around a house in front of other people, uh, naked, there might be some shame. Not so with what's going on here. So they become self-conscious and they attempted to cover their nakedness, which was not an issue previously. They were not ashamed of it. And it, so that, that's descriptive of the state, what's often referred to as the state of innocence prior to the sin. Right. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. The, the word for coverings slash aprons, I think the King James says aprons, literally means a sash, a belt, or a loincloth. So that's what they decided to put on. And God will deal with that a little bit later. All right, so let's talk now about the consequences. And Tammy, that'll, I think, hit on what you're dealing with. Somebody read verses... No, just read verse 8. Okay. Somebody on the live stream made a comment, and they worded it. Timber, this goes back to what you were saying earlier. They worded it better than I did, talking about Adam and Eve's sin and stuff. But she says they had no point of reference for evil, even though they were told not to eat. It, 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 that's what I mean by naive. They had nothing to compare it to of what if I do do this and what, what's going to happen then. There was no... And that's, I think that's hard for us to picture because, well, the world we come into is full of sin. And it's just, you know, it's all around us all the time. We don't have to contend with a state of never having seen a transgression of God's law like these people. So it's a wholly different perspective. And that's what's so important about this text. And Paul brings this out in Romans chapter 5. It's either in verses 13 or 14, where he says that no man has sinned after the similitude of Adam. There, there is no way to duplicate what happened here in the garden. No way. This is the first ever sin. These are the first ever consequences to sin. And like I said, you and I see it and, and live with that stuff all the time now. So there's no way to really, I guess, like kind of wrap your mind or wrap our minds around what they were experiencing at that point in time, if that makes sense. If there were no sin, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that wouldn't be a sin, no. It might have been a bad decision, but you've not violated a law of God by touching a hot stove. I don't know. <laughs> What's our verse? 
Deuteronomy 29, 29. <laughs> True. God did not set them up to fail. Giving them a choice and setting them up to fail are two different things. They knew the restriction. They just didn't know what would happen if they violated it. What the, and, and not just the immediate consequences, because they were immediate. Their eyes were opened. To me, it seems immediately. They tried to cover themselves as soon as they possibly could. But what about long term? I mean, that, there is no conception there would have been no conception of long-term consequences and the curses that are getting ready to be pronounced upon them. And that's what I was saying, and that's why Romans 5 is so important here to, to see the magnitude of what happens here. They knew things then that they didn't know, that they weren't aware of, and that's why I use the phrase, they became self-conscious. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. I don't see how. Here's the thing. With, with a lot of these questions, we want answers for, I don't know everything they did or didn't know. You know, like in terms of death. Did they, under, did they even understand when God said, the day you eat thereof, you will die? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I, I think that perspective is we're looking at it from our end of history. And there's no way for us to conceptualize from their end of history prior to the sin. It was just, it was a wholly different world. I don't know if they argued over dinner or, you know, Adam the trash, you know. I don't know. No comment. Verse 8 is anthropomorphic. Anthro. Anthropos, man and morphic. You, you take something that is not human and you give it human attributes. God is spirit, right? John 4, 24. So was God literally walking in the garden? Could they hear his footsteps? God doesn't have feet. Okay? This is, this is indicative of intimate fellowship. We need to understand that. Uh, and when he asks this question, well, let's deal with verse 8 here first. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. I wrote a, a note in the margin of my Bible. Who hides, literally hides, when they get in trouble? So Derek, when Tammy's getting on to you about something, do you go hide somewhere like so she can't find you? Well, <laughs> bad question. But generally speaking, adults don't do that. Kids do. Because they know they've done something that they shouldn't have done. And there are going to be consequences that come. So again, yes. And again, I think this speaks to the state of innocence that they were existing in at that point in time. And I just, I don't think it's possible for us to answer the questions of, you know, the, the hypotheticals and the ifs. It's just, we're, we're looking at it from the wrong end of history to answer those types of questions. It, we just know that everything was perfect until now. And it, it opened the floodgate to every bit of evil that we see in the world today. Some people believe, I, read, I actually read this today in an article, some people, and this is, to me this is kind of academic, it doesn't really matter, but one guy was saying he believed that this was Jesus, the pre-incarnate word, you know, before he came into flesh. Okay. I don't know. I think it was, I think it's not literal language. I think it's indicative of the 
Because, again, God is spirit. God's not walking around in a garden. But He could communicate with them openly. And they could communicate with Him openly. Again, it's a wholly different experience, you might say, than what we are used to. I just have to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think it's I, the, the instinctual response, I think it's that the, the naivete is gone now. The innocence is gone now. The state of, because this is not the first time God's communicated with them, and they were naked before this, that's been, never been an issue. It's like now that's, because of what they've done, their mentality has changed. They've got a reason to hide now. No question about that. Well, so you have then verses 9 and 11, all right? Where are you? Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? God is not seeking information here. That's your next blank. God is not seeking information in those questions. These are questions of accountability. And again, that's, we do that with our children. We ask them questions. No, we know the answer. It's not for us to, what did you do? We know what you did. It's, it's the process of accountability and uh, guilt, however you want to say it. So, we've already addressed that, second, that next bullet point. It seems, seems to indicate the state of innocence prior to their sin. Do what? Things don't change very much, do they? No, they don't. Sure. Humanity's not changed. And, and that's the thing. So verse 10. Somebody read verse 10 for us. Okay, that tells us what they heard. And that's why I say there in regard to verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Well, they heard Him. He's speaking. He's communicating with them. Well, when I heard that, I was afraid... Because I was naked. Again, there was no conception of that before. Uh, and then, beginning in verse 12, 12 and 13, you have, as I put in your outline here, the origin of the blame game. Somebody read those two verses, 12 and 13. Is that true, Colin? That's a true statement, right? All right, keep reading. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I heard. Is that true? What's missing here? Those are true statements. What? Accountability, personal responsibility. What have you done? Who told you this? And that's the, that's the question. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? The answer, I mean, while he made true statements, the right answer is, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not? Yes. That's the right answer. So while he, while he stated a, made a true statement, it was the wrong answer. So, neither Adam nor Eve was willing to accept personal responsibility. That sentence sounds weird to me because I had typed it out and neither Adam nor Eve were. And the grammar police on Word Perfect, or Microsoft Word rather, checked my grammar and said it should be was. So if you disagree with me, you disagree with Word Perfect, Word, uh, Microsoft Word. I couldn't get over that all afternoon. Yeah, you gave her to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. God gave her to him. That's
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the sense of temptation, sin, and consequence, they were absolutely innocent. They were completely unashamed because there was, again, there was no. Well, sure. Yeah. What, you know, what was there prior to this sin? You know, they're scared, okay? They're, they're ashamed and they're afraid. Prior to this event, what was the relationship like with God? We're not told. You know, all that's not laid out, but they knew something that they needed to be afraid and ashamed. So, I guess we'll pick up in verse 14 next week. We'll start talking about all the curses, all right? There's no indication that they that there was any idea that that was a possibility until it presented itself. I have no idea. Oh, you mean between like God and yes, yes, absolutely. So in, that's a good question, John. In time, there's no question that the met, the mode of God's transportation to man changed. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>